Welcome. I'm Becky Bruce, and I'm here again with Dave Colley to talk about episode two of season three of Cold. Hi, Dave. How's it hey, going? Hey, good, Becky. Thanks. Um, episode one ended on kind of a cliffhanger. We finally got to meet Cherie Warren, the focus of, se- of season three here, but um, she disappears yeah. at the end of episode one. So episode two begins, and there's a whole lot of timeline confusion. Mm. Um, how did you sort out all of that? That just feels like that must have taken, you know, one of those big boards with thumbtacks and the whole bit. (laughs) Uh, It's actually a spreadsheet is how I work on that. But uh, what we are dealing with is a situation where Cherie disappears and we have different stories about how and when that happened. Um, And they're pretty similar, but there are some crossover points where the times don't match up. Uh, So in season three, episode two, we kind of start out following Cherie through the day of her disappearance. In the morning, we know she meets up with her estranged husband to do a custody exchange to hand off her son. She heads to her job, uh, which is like 30 miles away from where she lives. And then during the day, she makes some phone calls. She talks to a coworker, goes to lunch. It's about 6.30 in the evening uh, when, according to her co-worker, this man named Richard Moss, they walk out of the building together, the workplace, and part ways in the parking lot. And that's the last time anyone is known to have seen Cherie. Now, she had this plan to meet up with her estranged husband, supposedly, and uh, pick him up at a car dealership and give him a ride back to his house after she got off work. Uh, when police come to talk to the estranged husband and ask him, you know, if he knew what happened to Cherie, he says, uh, we had this plan, but I called it off. I can't remember why I didn't go down there. I just know that I called her and, and told her I wasn't coming. So it creates this question. Why did she, you know, tell this coworker she was going to pick up her estranged husband if that plan had been canceled? And that's never been reconciled. Uh, We also end up having, you know, Cherie's mom uh, give her version of events, which the times, again, don't match up quite right. So it does get kind of confusing trying to follow that all through. Yeah, I practically needed a spreadsheet to keep up with you, but I felt (laughs) like you did a good job of helping explain it. How did you find Richard Moss? Richard Moss, uh, you know, his name was in the report, uh, the police report from when Cherie disappeared. He was quickly acknowledged to be a, a contact that she had the day that she disappeared, somebody who was believed to be the last person to see her. And uh, because of that, obviously, was a high interest person for investigators to talk to in her disappearance. Uh, Richard wasn't from Salt Lake City, where the disappearance happened. In fact, he lived, you know, a couple hundred miles away in a rural part of Utah and was only in Salt Lake for uh, a training uh, session that he was doing with Cherie. She was teaching him how to use a new computer system for the credit union that they worked at. Richard had been interviewed over the phone by a detective when this all happened back in 1985, and then a couple of times in the years since by cold case detectives when they they would pick the case up and kind of reopen it. Um, So I reached out to Richard just based on seeing his name in the report and thinking, you're probably somebody important for me to talk to to tell this story. Uh, Could I come visit you and, and interview you about your experience? And so when I went to his house and sat down. We spent, you know, the day together, went to lunch, had this really long and and frank conversation about everything he remembered. Uh, One of the things that he said to me was, well, you're the first person that's ever come down here and, you know, put eyeball to eyeball with me, which was, uh, I thought, a a pretty stunning thing for him to say. Uh, You know, this is the last person known to have seen Sheree alive, and he's only ever been interviewed over the phone. Um, Seemed a little surprising to me. Well, especially since he was still in Salt Lake, ostensibly at the th- beginning yes. of all of this, right? So it, I, I can make an argument for the small town police department might not have had the resources to travel to Richfield. It is kind of a long drive. Mm-hmm. Um, and especially knowing that they didn't go to Las Vegas, which is another thing I'm going to ask you about. Got it. I get that. But he was in Salt Lake. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this is really the beginning of a dynamic that we're going to see throughout uh, season three of Cold, which is this tug of war between these police departments over, you know, who is going to be responsible for this case. Uh, Cherie Warren was last seen in Salt Lake City. The Salt Lake City Police Department 
probably should have been the lead agency in investigating her disappearance. That's not the way it played out. It ended up with this little suburb of Roy, a uh, police department much, much smaller, and they didn't have the, the manpower, the personnel, to be able to pursue all of those leads as aggressively as maybe Salt Lake City uh, Police Department could have. So, you know, um, it was surprising to me to hear that Richard Moss hadn't been interviewed in person, but then when I looked at it in whole and realized that this is a, a problem or a theme that we see with this entire case, it made a lot more sense. Were you ever yourself able to establish whether Cher- Cherie made it to the dealer? To the dealership, yeah. So uh, the dealership is like a couple of blocks away from the office in Salt Lake City. Um, I went so far as basically you know, walking that distance myself, and, and doing that really struck me that th- this is a small window of time and physical space for somebody to just v- disappear into. Uh, we know that when Cherie vanished, uh, her car was also unaccounted for. So if she had gone to this dealership and somebody had you know waylaid her along the way, where did her car end up? We, we didn't have an answer to that question. Um, investigators at the time in 1985 supposedly went and questioned staff at this car dealership. Uh, some apparently said they thought they had seen her. Others you know, were clear in saying they hadn't seen her. But I think if you walk into a busy car dealership today and start asking random people, you know, have you seen this, this person uh, a you know, day, two, later, a week later, they're not going to be able to give you a good answer. And what we know is there were no police reports written, you know, with the names of the people at this dealership saying who was talked to, what questions were they asked. So uh, we can't really definitively say whether or not Cherie made it to that dealership. How about Richard Moss himself? Did you find him pretty credible? I did. And and I'll tell you why. I think uh, when people listen to the episode, though, they might hear Richard speak and, and uh, raise an eyebrow a little bit. You know, Richard is um, – he comes off a little different. And uh, so there is a, a part of me that that thinks, OK, well, is there a scenario where Richard could have been involved in this? And I think law enforcement had the same thought. But what I will tell you is <clears throat> Richard's recall of the events of that day are really good. And uh, he also made notes that he provided to law enforcement pretty soon after this happened. And so when I sat down and talked to him, I had a copy of those notes, but Richard hadn't reviewed them in many, many years. So I asked him what he remembered. We talked through that. And then when I was uh, done asking him the questions, I gave him his own notes and he reviewed those. And he was able to say, okay, yeah, yep, that lines up with what I remember. Oh, I hadn't remembered this piece or that piece. Um, And the thrust of his story hadn't changed over the years. There was nothing that stood out to me as... Um, Richard trying to conceal anything or, you know, uh, facts that didn't match up or anything like that. How about Jack Bell? He strikes me as a really interesting character that we meet in this episode. Yeah, Jack Bell. Jack Bell, Detective Jack Bell, uh, is one of the most fascinating people I've met doing cold case work. Uh, He was uh, a sheriff's deputy who became a police detective, and he ended up as the lead investigator on Cherie's case. Uh, Jack is now retired. And he is not afraid to call it like he sees it. Um, And so when we sat down and talked about this case, he was very open about um, not only his successes, but also, you know, some of the places where he feels like maybe he might have have fallen short in this investigation. Um, And he is not afraid to call out other cops or suspects in this case, I think, as we hear in the episode. Yeah, we'll get into a little bit more with that with the next episode. But before we go on this one, I I just have to ask, do you have any idea where the evidence from the car is now? No. So uh, this was, you mentioned it, I mentioned it, Cherie's car disappeared with her. And about six weeks after she disappeared, it turns up behind the Aladdin Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas, Nevada, hundreds of miles away from Salt Lake City where it was last seen. And so the question at the time was, how did it get there? Um, you know, one of the thoughts that was floated publicly was, well, maybe somebody, you know, carjacked Cherie and drove her car to Las Vegas and then hopped on a plane or maybe, you know, she ran away on her own and hopped on a plane. Neither of those scenarios really uh, made a lot of sense. What maybe looked more likely to police was that somebody who knew Cherie had uh, grabbed her and the car, driven to Las Vegas, and then flown back to Salt Lake City. Now, when the car was discovered, it had been sitting in this parking lot for weeks. It was dirty. We know there were uh, 
efforts to, to search it. And the only thing that seemed to maybe be evidence was a fingerprint that was lifted off one of the windows. Uh, that print went into Las Vegas police evidence. It sat there until just a couple of years ago when it finally came home to Utah. So we know that's being looked at. But the car itself uh, was later turned back over to Cherie's estranged husband. And uh, it's changed hands a couple of times since. And it's gone. So um, the only evidence that we have out of that car, as far as we know, is just this one fingerprint. Wow. I have so many more questions about that. But... I feel like people will get some of those answers if they listen to the episode. So how can they do that? Yeah. So uh, Cold Season 3 is available right now anywhere you get your podcasts. I'm quite partial myself to Apple Podcasts, uh, but also um, Amazon Music is a great place if you want to binge the whole season right now.